Okay, well, let me this morning read another passage. It kind of gives us a glimpse uh, into what I believe is heaven in its current state. And, you know, there's several things in here that we'll want to look at. We're not going to be able to touch on everything, for, uh, uh, just to let you know up front. But we do want to look at our condition in particular uh, in heaven and the company that we'll be keeping in heaven. Hebrews chapter 12, <clears throat> I'd like to read verses 18 through 24. The author to the Hebrews, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says this. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched. Again, referring to Mount Sinai back when God gave the law. And to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Uh, again, remember the author to the Hebrews is contrasting the old covenant with the new covenant, and um, certainly in the new covenant, we know that um, there, there are much greater blessings. And Certainly, what we're coming to is a lot better than what the uh, children of Israel had to come to on Mount Zion, uh, Sinai as God instilled the, His fear in their hearts. And I think largely become, uh, was because the majority of them were not converted, and the reason why they served the Lord was um, because of fear. But we serve the Lord because of love. And it's not that there weren't people who loved them at that time, just fewer than we might imagine. So anyway, what we want to focus on is what it is our Lord Jesus Christ has opened to us through His work. What is the end? What, where, what is the goal? What are we racing towards? What is this desire the Lord has given to us for Himself? What is it going to result in at the end? And that certainly is the greatest reason we have to love Him. So remember last time we were looking at another reason to love God, which is that He has delivered us from eternal punishments, and some of the things we saw, remember, was that hell is a real place. And if we don't believe that, okay, we really no reason to be thankful for God's forgiveness and delivering us from it. Jesus tells us it's real, and that really settles the case, and he warns us against going there um, because, he says, hell is a place of terrible suffering. He describes it as a place of fiery torment, both in its current form and future, and that varies based upon the sins that those who are there have committed. We also saw that this suffering increases after the resurrection and the judgment because then it will be not only in soul but also in body. We saw that it's further possible that it continues to increase, the torment continues to increase as its residents continue to sink in the lake of fire because of their continued sins. And we saw that it might even be worse than that if the tormented also torment each other. And again, we remember we were looking at um, at least one person's conception of hell, uh, Dante's Inferno. I'm not saying that Dante necessarily got it right with all his circles of descending torture, but um, there are descending levels of punishment. They may just not be taking place like that, but it has been you know, conjectured that these demons who are suffering in hell may not just be idle, and they may be th making things worse for those who are there. But what makes it worst of all, of course, is hell is where God carries out what He threatens. His just punishment for crimes committed. Remember, God is the fire that burns in hell. And we think about 
You know, hell is a place sometimes that's away from the presence of God, and he's withdrawn his presence from there, and he doesn't really want to think about what's going on there, and he didn't really send anybody there, and, and he's not punishing anyone. They're just, you know, they're just suffering because God made this fire for the devil and his angels, and they decided to go there. That's not what's going on. God is sending them there justly, and he is the one punishing them there justly for their crimes. Now, remember, we also saw most who have died in this world, most who have lived and died, are there now. Most who are alive now will go there. And the same is true of most yet to be born. Jesus says that the way to destruction is broad, and many go in that way. And perhaps the most horrible thing to think about is that those who go in never come out. They will suffer forever. Now, why do I bring all those things to our minds again? Well, we saw there's, there's a couple of reasons at least. There's a, you know, there's a reason why we should share the gospel with others. Christ has commanded it. But, of course, those that we're sharing with are in this danger. This is the only way they can escape. But remember, this is what we deserved. This would have been our punishment, but for God's grace. God sent his son to save us. He sent his spirit to raise us. Having trusted in Jesus Christ, he has forgiven us. And we are safe from that wrath that will burn forever. So we have there a very great reason to love the Lord and to be thankful for what he has done. But, of course, there, there are many reasons why we should love the Lord. And here's another one we're looking at this morning. We should love him not only because he saved us from hell, but because he will bless us forever in heaven. Now, again, we often use the word heaven to refer to where the saints are now and the new heavens and the new earth, and I may make that mistake as I'm going through here, but we do need to remember that heaven exists now, but heaven will not always exist. Um, heaven and earth are going to come together in the new heavens and the new earth, and we call that the new heavens and the new earth. So um, I'm, I'm going to try to make that distinction as we go through. But this morning, I want us to think about that, what it is we have to look forward to, okay? First, in heaven, in the intermediate states, and I'll talk about that a little bit, and the new heavens and the new earth, which will come after the final judgment. So first of all, let's consider the intermediate state. And I know that sounds like a fancy term, but it's, it really is referring to that time between our death and the resurrection, okay? Before Jesus returns, there are people who are there now in what we call the intermediate state. It's, it's between, you know, what's going on here and consummation. It's the in-between time, okay? Well, having trusted Jesus when we die, we'll immediately enter into heaven, you know, the dwelling place of God. Now, as, as we noted before, I think we did, there is no soul sleep. The intermediate state is not a time of unconsciousness and we're not aware of what's going on. That, that's, not idea, that, that's not what the Bible teaches. There are those who believe. Among them, um, Seventh-day Adventists and I think Mormons, that when we die, that our souls are still united to our bodies, but they're unconscious during the time before the resurrection and don't become conscious again until the Lord raises us to stand before him in judgment. Well, how do we know that isn't true? Well, we saw last week that when the rich man died, remember what happened? He immediately lifted up his eyes and he was in hell. He was conscious and aware of his torment. The same thing was true of Lazarus with regard to the fact that when he died, he was immediately aware of his comfort in heaven, uh, the, the, being comforted in the bosom, as it were, of Abraham is, is not talking about some compartment, you know, in hell. It's talking about heaven. He was in paradise, as Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Remember what Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, we know that that gave Paul the courage that he had to do what he did for the Lord because he knew that if someone killed him, if he were to die, 
he would be with the Lord. But that passage also argues against soul sleep. Remember that he wrote this while he was in prison, not knowing whether he would be executed or not, given the possibilities he was kind of musing or debating on which would be better. Would it be better if I'm executed? I'll be with the Lord. Or is it better if I live and continue the work? Well, he said to depart and to be with Christ was very much better. Now think about that debate in Paul's mind in the light of soul sleep. Would it be better for me to live and to serve the Lord or to go unconscious for thousands of years before the judgment? That's not what he was talking about. You see, in that case, the, the choice would be clear. Lord, let me live so I can do more for you before I go into this state of soul sleep. No, he knew that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He said to die is gain because he would be with his Lord in heaven. And when that time comes for us, we will also be with our Lord. Now, why is it gain? Well, because when that happens, we will immediately become perfect. In our passage, the author to the Hebrews calls the saints, in verse 23, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Notice spirits, but spirits made perfect. Perfect in what sense? Well, morally perfect. There will be no more sin, nothing but perfect holiness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, after holiness, for they shall be satisfied. The goal that God had in redeeming us will finally be realized. We will be like Christ, at least morally like Him. We need to remember that God didn't send His Son into the world merely to save us from the guilt of our sins, though we are very thankful for that. Remember what Top Lady says in, in his famous hymn, Rock of Ages, Let the water and the blood... From thy riven side which flowed, be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. You know, guilt, we're all happy about the guilt part. But, and, but as Christians, we should be equally happy, if not more so, about the power of sin is broken in our lives so that we can now uh, love the Lord and serve Him where we couldn't before. Well, in heaven, it's going to be perfect. God sent His Son into the world in order to make us like His Son. Remember that, that He, that is Jesus, would be the firstborn among many brethren. That's the reason why the Lord gave us His Holy Spirit, why the Spirit of God opened our eyes to Jesus' beauty. He gave us a desire for His holiness. Okay, that's what makes Jesus lovely to us. It's not His physical appearance. It's His character. Remember, holiness is love, His perfect love for what is good and right. The Spirit of God opened our eyes to see His beauty, and that's what drew us out to trust in Him. Faith works by love. Remember, as Paul talks to the Galatians. Uh, this is also, though, why, not only why we trusted Him, but why we would also want to be like Him. This is the reason why everyone who is born again by the Holy Spirit fights against our sins. That's why we do that, why we work to put our sins to death, why we want to be done with them, why we want to do the right thing, because we love what we see in the Lord Jesus Christ and we want to be like Him. That's why we have the struggle we have in this world between the old man and the new, between the flesh and the spirit that Paul again talks about in Galatians. Well, that struggle is going to come to an end, and it will come to an end in heaven where that work will be complete, where we will be perfectly filled with the Holy Spirit and so perfected in holiness. You know, think about this for a minute. If sin is actually the absence of, of good, there we will be perfectly filled with the good, so there will be no evil. It's all gone. You know, actually, we can't even say it's gone because R.C. reminded us that it doesn't really exist. It is the absence of the Holy Spirit, but there we will be perfectly filled with the Spirit and perfected in holiness. Paul tells us, in this body we groan, not simply because of our physical issues and our pain, though we do groan about that too, but because of our sinfulness. 
we want to be free from that evil. In heaven, that groaning is going to be replaced by joy because we will be like Christ. Now, that is one of the greatest of the blessings that is in store for us in heaven. But there are others, okay? The passage we read in Hebrews tells us we will also enjoy the very best company that we've ever experienced. We'll be with the holy angels. Those are the spirits that God created to make sure that we will arrive safely in heaven. The Bible says that when a soul on earth is saved, the angels rejoice. I think the angels rejoice too when those souls are safely brought to heaven. And if the parable of the rich man and Lazarus is correct at every point as far as if that's how far Jesus wants us to take it, the angels also convey us to heaven. We don't, our spirit doesn't just simply you know, all of a sudden uh, take off towards heaven when we die, but the angels come and take us there. But when we arrive with the angels, the angels rejoice and we get to enjoy the company of the holy angels. When we're in heaven, we'll also be with the saints, the holy ones, those who are also perfected uh, in holiness and righteousness, and some of them that we even knew while we were on the earth, family members and, and friends who have gone before us into heaven. We have no reason to doubt that we will recognize them and that they also will welcome us when we enter. Now, those of us who love church history, <laughs> we're, we're going to see some other characters there that uh, we have so much admired for so many years. I mean, those that are in the Bible, we're going to see, of course, uh, David, and we're going to see the, the apostles, uh, Paul and Peter and John. We're going to see heroes in church history, Calvin, Luther, and Zwingli, and I get to see Edwards. <laughs> we, all, we all get to see him if you're interested. We're going to see Whitfield and Spurgeon. Maybe for some of you, it'll be Spurgeon. But we'll get to spend time with them. Now, that is, if we can manage to take our eyes off of the more glorious sights that we have in heaven. And that first one, of course, will be Jesus. We will see the one who humbled himself to save us in all of his glory, seated on his throne, at the right hand of God. And again, here comes that particular point. Are we going to see God? Well, there are those who believe we will see him. Now, we're not going to see him or any of these things with our physical eyes because we won't have them, right? Our bodies are going to be in the grave. Our souls, the spirits of righteous men made perfect. And by the way, that should give us a bit of a cue as to what Paul's referring to in that 2 Corinthians 5 passage. Do, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, but do we, what's this dwelling from heaven he's talking about? Well, here are the spirits of righteous men made perfect. So perhaps the dwelling is heaven. As Jesus said, I leave to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and bring you to where I am, that dwelling place in heaven. Well, again, we're not going to have our bodies, we're not going to have our physical eyes, but we will still be able to see We'll be able to see these things going on around us even though they are largely immaterial. And we will likely be able to see God, I believe we will, as he reveals himself to us. Remember the angels and the spirits of righteous men, they're all invisible too. But I think we will see them and we will know them. And I believe we will also see and know God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit seated on the throne revealing himself to us in the most wonderful way, we will have this sight of the most perfect and glorious being that ever has or ever will exist in the fullness of the beauty of his holiness, which is something that apparently the Lord is going to reveal in some way that we'll be able to perceive, and it will be beautiful. And we will bask in that love, in his full love, the love of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the love of the angels and of the saints, and we will be perfected in love. And being so, we'll be able to love them in return with that same kind of love. Now, that, that is the intermediate state. That is heaven. Um, and that's really, I think, about as much as we can know about it, even though we, we do see you know, things about, you know, descriptions of what it 
what it's like right now in the book of Revelation and we see in Isaiah and so forth. Um, what really matters, I think, is what we're going to experience. Okay, and we'll see that a little bit more, I think, um, as we look at this next point. Okay? Remember, heaven is only the first phase of our blessedness. There's a second one. As, you know, what was true for the wicked in the sense that things become worse for them on Judgment Day, since now their suffering after that day will be both in soul and body. They're going to be tormented. We saw that last week because now they have a body as well as a soul. The same thing is true in a parallel sense for the righteous, that things will become better for us on that day when our bodies will also have been raised and glorified and our souls reunited with them and we enter into the new creation. Remember what Jesus tells us in Matthew 25 that he will say to the sheep on that day and we will be numbered among the sheep if we've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, if we're doing his works. Matthew 25 verse 34, come you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, here, you know, what, what's going to be the difference? Well, the difference, as, as much as we can understand it, is this, that our blessedness is going to become physical as well as spiritual. We're no longer going to live in heaven. Okay? Heaven is going to be a thing of the past. You know, we're not going to be spirits that are disembodied and separated from our bodies, but on the new earth, we're going to be living there with our glorified bodies. One of the, um, uh, I don't know, if, you know how often we think about this, but I, ha I have talked about it, I think, uh, recently, that originally God made heaven and earth to be one, that heaven was really in the Garden of Eden. Uh, that's where God dwelt. That's where God had fellowship with his creatures. And then those things became separate after sin. But the work of Christ brings those things together again as they originally were in the garden. Heaven and earth are again joined together. And we read in the book of Revelation that God and the Lamb are going to live with us. And things are going to be perfect. They were going to be as they were before only much better. If you look at some of the imagery used in the book of Revelation, you'll see it's similar to what it was like in the garden, except it's going to be better than it was in the garden, much better, because this is the inheritance that Jesus, the God-man, has earned through his perfect obedience to the Father, which he now shares with us. As we've already read, John tells us there's no longer going to be any tears, any death, any mourning, any crying or pain, which really you know, would, would have more application, I think, to physical than spiritual bodies, but only perfect happiness and peace and joy. Since Jesus has reversed the effects of the fall and he's making all things new again, of course, that's, that affects the creation, that affects our bodies, but here's something else that's interesting to think about, and we don't have anything specific about it. But if, God, if, the God, or if, if Christ's work really has reversed the curse on all creation, perhaps we're going to see animals in the new earth as well. Because remember, God made them, and they were good, and they were for His glory, and the curse that Adam brought into the world is what killed the animals. Jesus comes into the world and he reverses the curse. So is he going to bring animal life back? It's possible because those things give glory to him. And if that's the case, if he brings the animal life back, you know, have you ever thought about, am I ever going to see that dog, that cat, or whatever it is I had as a pet, am I ever going to see that again? Well, it's possible. Now, after this judgment, we're also going to have our rewards. Okay, Judgment day is when we receive them. The new heavens and the new earth is where we enjoy them. It's hard to understand, perhaps, the full extent of what that means. But we do know a couple of things, that there will be places of honor in heaven. Uh, remember what James and John asked, I think, through their mother? <laughs> um, Grant, Lord, in, in your kingdom that my two sons may sit one on the right and one on the left. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking for. But he didn't deny there were those places of honor, did he? 
He says, those places are for those that my, my father has chosen and ordained. And I would imagine those places will be for those who have suffered the most for the Lord Jesus Christ and who have labored the most for his glory and his honor. There will be those places of honor and there will be degrees of blessedness that are based on our service. I mean, certainly it means something, doesn't it? When the Lord gives the talents and then his servants use those talents and then he rewards them for the use of those talents, there has to be some sense in which they're rewarded. So, you know, theologians have wrestled with what exactly that reward might look like. And you'll recall the Puritans, Thomas Watson, Jonathan Edwards, they described it in this way, that we're going to be like so many containers of differing sizes thrown into an infinite sea of love, and each of us will have a different ability to enjoy that love, but all of us will be filled to the full. So they described it as different capacities to, to be able to enjoy heaven, but no one feeling any lack at all because they are filled to the full, to the extent of the capacity they have to enjoy heaven, they are experiencing that. Now, the final judgment determines just the beginning level of our blessedness, just as it does for the beginning level of suffering for the, for the wicked. But as the, the wicked continue to increase in suffering through all eternity, the blessedness of the saints increases through all eternity. And it does, perhaps, through our activities. Now, we're not sure exactly what we're going to be doing in heaven. There's another questionable thing. Or Again, heaven, I use the wrong term. In the new heavens and the new earth, what are we going to do there? Okay. We do know we're going to worship. We know that's going on now in heaven. That's certainly going to continue on the new earth. But we may also serve the Lord in, on that new earth. Doing what? I'm not sure exactly. But if we do, it could lead to greater reward. But even if worship is all we do, our happiness is still going to grow. Jonathan Edwards believed that true happiness, and, and let me ask you to think about this for a minute, true happiness, true joy, true blessedness comes from knowing God. Would you agree? Now, not just knowing about Him by reading theology books, though that's helpful, in getting to know God, but the kind of knowledge that we gain through fellowship with Him, okay? Spending time with Him in our devotions. You know, our, our love for Him grows, our understanding of Him grows in more than just a theological sense. Well, in heaven, Jonathan Edwards believes, we're going to grow in that kind of knowledge. And since He is infinite, we're never going to reach the end of what we're going to learn about him. And so our growth in blessedness is never going to end, but will increase to all eternity. So the final judgment just sets the starting point. And from there, we continue to ascend, as it were, in our blessedness. Now, last week, we also saw that we're likely going to be able to see hell from heaven. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. And that we're going to be aware of people we know who are suffering in hell. But as R.C. Uh, reminded us on that particular Lord's Day in the evening, even that is not going to disturb our happiness because our holiness, our sanctification, our desire for God's glory will be so advanced and so perfected that we will be able to see them suffering and rejoice that God's justice is vindicated. Now, like God, we need to think about this. God, God doesn't delight, as the Scripture tells us, God takes no delight at, in, in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked repent, okay? And as Jonathan Edwards pointed out, when God sees one of His creatures made in His image suffering in hell, He doesn't take delight in the fact that this person is just simply suffering. And that would be, you know, masochistic. Rather, he delights in the fact that justice is being served, that this one who has committed these infinite crimes against him is being punished for those crimes. And in the same way, we're not going to be happy to see people suffering just because they're suffering. 
but we're going to be rejoicing that they're suffering justly because they are God's enemies. And, and think about it in these terms. You know, when you, when, when you think of a person on earth uh, being executed, you know, we don't see that very often anymore, but there was a time when people were, you know, uh, capital punishment was executed on someone, and maybe you felt a little bit sorry for that person, you know, as, as you're thinking about this human being who's executed, he's dying. But what if that individual, what if you see him rather as being executed because he has unjustly taken away the life of one or more people? You know, how does that change the way you view it? When justice is being served, this person took away unjustly the life of someone else, and so he has forfeited his life. Well, again, same kind of thing. They have sinned against God, and they deserve that. And of course, here's another thing. Our seeing what's going on there and knowing that that's where we deserve to be will increase our happiness in heaven through all eternity. So what makes heaven to be heaven? isn't exactly what we may think when we look, read the book of Revelation and we see these descriptions of gates that are made of giant pearls and streets of gold. You know, if that's what we're looking forward to, we really don't want heaven for the right reasons. If you've ever been in the health and wealth movement, <laughs> that's all they focus on. Streets of gold, yeah, gold. You know, I'm going to have all this gold. I'm going to have these giant pearls. I'm going to have all these precious stones. Oral Roberts talked about, you know, when you give to his ministry... You're sending up all these uh, great materials that, that Jesus is taking and building into a mansion for you, okay? That's the way they view heaven, where you have what you want on earth, only it's much greater in heaven. You have a bigger mansion, more money, more jewels, and well, that's, that's purely carnal. You see, we're not even going to be concerned about those things in heaven. Even if God meant those things literally, they will mean nothing to us. The only thing that will matter is that we're in the presence of God and the Lamb, that we're with the saints and the angels, we are receiving their love, and we are loving them perfectly in return. The most enjoyable thing we experience in this world is love. Heaven is a world of love. Again, I mentioned before, we know this because of the foretaste of heaven. God is given to us by His Holy Spirit, who is called the down payment of our inheritance. That's what it means. We get a foretaste of glory through the Spirit. There we receive the full inheritance. So why should we love God? Because by His grace, we will not be tormented forever, but we will be loved forever, swallowed up in a world of infinite love. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, um, let's pray and let's thank the Lord for that mercy. And let's also prepare to come to the table where we're reminded again why it is that this world is available to us, why we will be there. It's not because of who we are, not because of what we've done, but because of what Christ has done alone.